So hello everybody, it's 7 p.m. Paris time. Um, I am very glad to and honored to welcome you on this filmed webinar dedicated to skin concern and to make an animation of uh, this webinar. I'm so glad to welcome Dr. Claudia Hernandez from Maybelline in uh, Colombia. Claudia, can you Thank introduce? Thank you, Valerie. Of course, uh, hello everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you today and being part of the Filmed team. And I'm Claudia Hernandez. My name is Claudia Hernandez, dermatologist. I work based in Medellin, Colombia, here in a clinic called CH Dermatologia. And I also work with clinical research regarding static medicine. And I'm very happy to be here with you today. So Claudia will go in depth of all the mechanism of action of skin concern with the latest data. Thank you in advance, Claudia. Then I'm very Thank pleased you. to welcome my friend and colleague, Ricky Smith, who's been working such a long time from South Africa. And Pretoria, Ricky, can you tell us a word about your specialty? So thank you very much, Valerie, and it's uh, such an honor to, to share this virtual stage with you, Valerie, and with you, Claudia. From So we are really representing all the continents. And um, so I'm from Pretoria, South Africa, and I have quite a long experience in aesthetic medicine and also specifically with the protocols of Filmed. So I think we have such a nice webinar where Claudia will explain more the pathophysiology behind the skin condition. And I will discuss how we can do, use the treatments and the wonderful protocols to address these skin concerns that we see a lot in our clinics. And then uh, Valerie will explain how we can actually advise our patients at home uh, to use the correct uh, skincare products at home. So I think it will be a very exciting uh, webinar to, to really help you and guide you on also not just to treat wrinkles and how to use the fillers, but really how to look after our patient's skin. And I really hope that you're going to enjoy it. Uh, and I hope that we can have a, a live event of this very soon. Thank you. Great. So when we're talking about skin concern, as Ricky said, it's really international and all our patients could have problematic of hydration, blemish, radiance, dark spots, wrinkles, and firmness. Now to come more in depth, some things that we are dealing with aesthetic and uh, not anti-aging, but positive pro-aging, we do know uh, that it is very important to go in depth educations of our patients. And mainly we said that in skin aging, there is two main factors that is intrinsic, but it's also accelerated by extrinsic factors like sun, tobacco, pollution, etc. that leads to skin aging, but nothing is a fatality and a reverse effect is possible as far as we go, mainly to target the, extra, the excess of oxidative stress and the glycation process. That is the very overall pictures of what happens in the skins and mainly in the three layers. But now I'm so pleased to welcome Claudia that will go more in depth with the latest data of Interactor. Claudia, please, it's your time. Yes, Valerie. And everything that you explain, we all know that this is called the exposome, which are all these external factors, all these environmental factors that have a very important impact in our skin aging. But they're not the only important factors that we need to take into account when we think about skin aging. There are other actors like the microbiome and the genome and all these three actors, they come together, they fuse and they have plenty molecular interactions that they explain all the mechanisms that are involved in skin aging. And one of them that is particularly important in the recent years is the microbiome. Microbiome is a collection of microbes that live inside of us. They live in the gut, but they also live in our outside which means they live in the skin and they live in an ecosystem with a, with a symbiotic um, communication where these two organs communicate all the time and they have very important functions for our skin health and for our, our homeostasis. So for instance, in our skin, the skin microbiome has communications 
with the exposome or the external factors and at the same time with the genome and they participate in functions like inflammation, skin aging, skin barrier regulation, wound healing. For instance, when we have something that is called dysbiosis, either we have it in our gut or we have it in our skin, when these microorganisms are not in equilibrium, we can have diseases. And in the skin, um, we can have immune, uh, immune imperatives that can translate into different skin diseases like acne, uh, seborrheic dermatosis, like atopic dermatitis, and even skin cancer. So it's very important this bidirectional communication between the gut and the skin where the gut health also influences the skin health and how beautiful a skin can be. So this is very important concept that all healthcare providers, we need to take into account when we do our treatments, we need to think systemically and not separating the skin from the other organs. So for instance, there is a curious data that I want to share with you. That is uh, when we have exposure to UV radiation, our microbiome in the gut has the possibility to repair this damage and participates in processes like uh, the photo aging prevention. Another important topic that we may need to think here is about vitamin D regulation. And we know that we, we receive the UV exposure. We synthesize this vitamin D and this vitamin D is very important for our gut health and for the prevention of many diseases that are associated with vitamin D deficiencies. And when we think about uh, ethnicities, the genome has also an important impact on how we age and how we have different features in our skin. So regarding pore size, we know that Asian skin, they have the smallest pores compared with other ethnicities. African-Americans, they have the largest pores because they have impaired um, interfollicular epidermis. So this gives this appearance of large pores. And regarding wrinkles, we know that Caucasians have a more earlier appearance of these wrinkles when compared with other ethnicities like Asians. So Asians and dark skin tone individuals have delayed appearance of wrinkles when compared with um, Caucasians. And this is due to the fact that they have more compact and thicker dermis. And regarding pigmentation, we know that dark skin individuals are more prone to have pigmentations and that both and all ethnicities during the process of aging, we increase the pigmentation, but in a different way. So Caucasians get more red skin and Asians, for example, they get more yellowish skin. Also, um, we know that um, dark skin tone individuals, they have more protection against UV damages when compared with Caucasian individuals. And uh, when comparing wrinkles, we know that Japanese individuals have less wrinkles than, for example, French individuals. And regarding hydration, we find that Caucasians have better skin barriers when compared with all the other ethnicities. And the worst skin barriers are found in Indian patients, followed by Chinese and then by African patients. So as you can see in this picture, there are plenty of ethnical differences, but they are also um, influenced by the exposome that we previously talked about. And when we talk about skincare and performing different types of treatments to our patients, in office treatments also, we need to have very clear classifications in order to perform the correct treatments to our patients. And we know that through history, there have been described many different classifications but none of them are completely enough or they fulfill all the criteria that we need. And we've been using, we still use this classification of 1910, that is the Elena Rubinstein skincare, skin classification that classifies the skin into dry, oily, mixed or sensitive skin. But this classification has a limitation is that it doesn't take into account concerns like wrinkles or pigmentations. 
Another very well-known classification is the Fitzpatrick classification. And we use these ones as dermatologists specifically to predict which individuals have more ability to tan or to get sunburn. Although this classification can be useful to determine risk of can skin cancer, it's not useful uh, in the way that it doesn't quantify the risk of cancer. And initially this classification was described for Caucasians. So they only had from one to four in the classification. And then they added the fifth and the sixth classification because they wanted to add individuals that are dark skin tone and Latin Americans, Indians and African Americans. But in these individuals, they only added them basing on the ethnicity, but not in the way they burn or they suntan. And also another limitation of this classification is that the Fitzpatrick skin type cannot predict the risk of hyperpigmentation after procedures like lasers or fillings. So this limits a little bit the way we use the classification. And of course, here we can see all the other different classifications we have. And one of the most important for us that is not well known is the Robert skin type system that takes into account this background ethnicity of the patient, but also the risk of hyperpigmentation and the scarring. And this one is useful when we want to do procedures. But when we want to talk about skincare, I want to bring to you this new classification that is the Bauman skin type indicator. The Bauman skin type indicator is a classification from 2006 that has four important dichotomous variables, which are oily to dry skin, resistant or sensitive skin, pigmented or not pigmented skin, and wrinkle or tight skin. So these four variables, we come, they come together and with a questionnaire of 64 items, it's a little bit more complex and complicated to classify, they will give us 16 different skin subtypes. Although it's a little bit complicated to do all this, this classification seems to be one of the most specific ones when we want to uh, guide our dermacosmetic treatments. So when we see all this uh, possibility of classification, I think that's Filmed portfolio with a 360 degree approach and is a new positioning of positive pro-aging can really answer specific skin concerns. Just to make a quick overview of the products needed on uh, daily use, we'll see all about the skin perfusion range. Then on uh, monthly use, we can have all the peelings made with gluconolactones, the bio with NCTF 135HA or the skin quality booster with MHAKN. And on the B annual, all the sculpting power with the art filler branch. But to go more uh, inside the skin perfusion branch, which is our the topic of today, uh, combining aesthetic protocols that we will go more in depth with Ricky and the cosmetics on the daily use, skin perfusion is a very updated and innovative branch, very easily to understand because very pragmatic to the different skin issues. First of all, I want to go in uh, uh, to prepare the skin in all the need with after cleanser, you know, to accelerate the exfoliation and the skin renewal with either the skin perfusion, the perfecting solution on a daily basis, which is enriched in gluconolactone, and on a weekly basis, the glycopyl mask. Then after we will see at the end the uh, Smooth repair treatments that is to prepare the, the it's okay, you can go, Claudia. And uh, after, yes, this is the pre treatment, which is e, e, uh, ultra important. I think it is one of the most important to prepare the skin to receive either biorevitalization or uh, cosmetics. You have to have an accelerating of skin renewal and keratolytic actions. And these two products, very well tolerated, really enhance this uh, benefit. Then, after, I think, 
Okay, just a word on gluconolactone, which is beta hydroxyacid, just coming from glycolic acid, which uh, polyhedric structures are converted to molecule much more tolerability. And besides its keratolytic actions and its antioxidant actions, it is, can be dedicated to all types of phototypes and even sensitive skins. It does also have a very good impact on oily skins, which is uh, very today, um, how would I say, requested because it clarifies and purifies the skins. So after I will go through one of the major skin concern about anti-aging, which is wrinkles. And Claudia, can you tell us more about the latest and recent data concerning uh, skin aging and more precisely wrinkles? Yes, of course. So previously we talked about the skin interactome that it's about all the relationships between the exposome, the microbiome and the genome. But we know that these relations are molecular relations and relations are now protein to protein interactions. And this has been elucidated in the last years in a molecular map that is the skin interactome map. So here, as you see in this graphic, there is, has been an identification of multiple molecular targets that are going and are right now in our present important for the development of multiple targeted therapies and to guide treatments. So this is very important today because in this way we can do very strategic and targeted treatments to our patients. So when we talk about premature skin aging, we all know that photoaging is caused by this chronic sun exposure of the, our skin to UVA and UVB, particularly in the sun exposed areas. And we know that this radiation, what it does is that it helps and it makes our skin to produce free radicals. It also activates inflammatory pathways and it makes um, an, induction, an induction also of pigmentation of wrinkles down-regulating the production also of collagen, elastin, and finally we can see this like the clinical picture of wrinkling and sagging. So here in this picture, I just wanna show you a typical example of a patient with premature aging or photoaging, which we can, where we can see all the changes regarding to the skin. We can see skin atrophy, the development of telangiectasias, the wrinkles, the rosies, and also the development of benign tumors of the skin like seborrheic keratosis, cherry angiomas, and of course, uh, precancerous uh, lesions like actinic keratosis and skin cancer also. So to grade all this photoaging, we all know the GoGlo scale. This is a very traditional scale used when we have from type one to type four, the different scales uh, regarding wrinkles. So for type one, we have early wrinkles. This will be an individual, a very young individual between the 20s and 30s. For type two, we have wrinkles that are only in motion. This could be individuals between the 30s and 40s. Then we have type three for wrinkles at rest. And then we have the type four, which is actually the patient with a lot of wrinkles all the time. So this is important to guide our treatments. And another type of wrinkles that with a totally different mechanism is are the sleep wrinkles, which are wrinkles that are produced during the sleep and they are produced because of the pulling of the skin in all directions, because of compression, tension and shear forces that we have during sleep. And during sleep, no one has ever described like they sleep in one position all night. We see that patients shift during all night between different positions. They can have approximately uh, 20 different positions during the night. And we do this because we want to relieve the ischemia and the discomfort that we feel. And of course, this is something unconscious, but the important thing is that the amount of time that we spend in one specific position last more when we get older because we shift from more positions to less positions. 
And all this is important because this will lead to the development of sleep wrinkles. How do we uh, recognize these wrinkles clinically? So clinically, these are wrinkles that do not correspond to muscle contraction, and they are wrinkles that they tend to be perpendicular to the expression lines. So now I would like to give the word to Ricky to tell us more about the different protocols that she has to treat this concern. Yes, thank you very much, Claudia. And I think uh, it can be very exciting to hear everything that we've just heard about the wrinkles and about the skin exposome and the interactome. But then we get to the point where, okay, so what do we do all about it? Because it sounds a lot more complicated. And this is exactly where I want to bring in the bone nutrilift protocol. Now, I think a lot of you know already about this protocol, but I think when we started doing bone nutrilift protocol, we didn't realize actually how wonderful this protocol is until we started seeing the patients coming back six months later saying, I want it again. And the doctors seeing that this is better than just seeing the results immediately after. Uh, and I think it really explains why, because it works on so many ways. So I'm first going to go through the protocols and then I just quickly want to explain why it's such a wonderful protocol so we can play the video. So this is just a reminder of the protocol. We've done a little bit of a, a change on the protocol, which I think is a very good change and you'll see it in this video. So the first step with this protocol is to do the fanning with either your art filler fine lines or then art filler universal. But fine lines is really a wonderful product. It's registered for fine wrinkles. Um, you can see I'm using a 25 gauge, 55 millimeter cannula, the bi-neutralif cannula. The very important thing of doing this fanning with fine lines, fine lines is a product that stimulates the tissue. It stimulates dermal collagen, it stimulates elastin. So everything that was lost with all of this inflammaging process, the dysbiosis, it's stimulating it. Um, but it needs to be in the right level. It needs to be very superficial. So you need to actually have a little bit of resistance with your cannula. So you can see as I'm going in, it, it shouldn't be in the plane where it's very easy to go because then we are in the smash. And we actually want to be a little bit above it in the retinocular cutis that we will also discuss in the next skin concern, which is uh, sagging. But this is really perfectly targeting the retinocular cutis if you are in that level. And we know that fine lines have got studies to support it, that in this level where we are injecting it, it's going to stimulate collagen and elastin production for 12 months and even up to 18 months. So we are really investing in the patient's skin for the next year or year and a half to make sure they don't have loss of collagen due to the whole mm -hmm. aging process that we've just discussed of the inflammation, the external factors that's breaking down collagen, breaking down collagen. Collagen. Now, for the first time, we are building up collagen. So a very important step. Then the next uh, step after, so you'll see I'm fanning it very nicely all over this patient that's typically complaining of these lateral cheek wrinkles. I have to tell you that I use it on quite a lot of places of the face. So forehead, I also use this typical uh, protocol, decollete, hands, it can be used. So anyway, we have wrinkles. So after I finish with this protocol, then I continue with the wonderful NCTF. And NCTF is really a miracle molecule. And I think if you're really concentrated on what Claudia explained on the oxidation process, the inflammation that we get from inside as well as outside, then the first thing that comes to mind is that we want to work against this oxidation. And how do we work against it is by providing the skin with antioxidants. And this is exactly what NCTF is doing. So what you see I'm doing now with the NCTF is um, I've adapted the bioneutralif protocol. I know Valerie also likes it this way, that we rather than inject it with either the your 32 gauge four millimeter needle or with the nano soft which can be a little bit tricky on the to the cheeks it's much easier around the eyes but some patients it works really well also on the cheeks but the 32 gauge four millimeter working in small little papules over the whole area 
And the reason why I prefer to use it with a needle is because we really want it to be intradermal and even epidermal because we are wanting to target this whole skin interactome with NCTF. And we know we see wonderful results. This is the patient before and after, very good results. They are very happy. It's very natural results. But the beauty lies after six months, after we've seen that whole new collagenesis process, that the glow that we see the reduced oxidative stress. It's just, they have something about their skin, like the je ne sais quoi effect. It's really, you cannot explain the skin difference on NCTF and the boosting then with the fine lines. So really the perfect protocol for wrinkles anywhere on the face that you can think of to treat the wrinkles. Um, obviously, some of the, the aspects that Claudia explained, such as the photo-aging, uh, the pigmentation spots, we can also address with peelings and lasers, but very nicely combined with this. So the other way to also treat the wrinkles as another video that I want to share with you, is also to use art filler fine lines, but with a needle. So here I'm using the 30 gauge needle that is inside the package in a very superficial manner. Now, very superficial because first of all, fine lines is meant for the superficial layers. And because we are going with a needle, we want to be in the superficial layers because this is a very safe layer. So this is really intradermal or just just subdermal but not any deeper than that because otherwise you have the risk still of intravascular placement so you'll see on this video it's really almost just my bevel going in just as you get the resistance of the dermis the perfect placement when you use the needle technique, very important, this is not a skin booster, it's a filler still. It does have very good skin boosting qualities, but you cannot leave papules or worms of products it, as it will remain there because it's not, it's a cross-linked hyaluronic acid. It contains a lot of free hyaluronic acid, but it still contains cross-linked. So make sure that with this type of injection that you remain with small quantities of amount and you can really target many wrinkles on the face and, and remember, hyaluronic acid on itself also has got this wonderful anti-inflammatory protocol. Okay, and this is not where we stop with the wrinkles. So the next thing is, what do, I, what do we tell our patients to use at home? Because it's so, so important that they continue the treatment at home. And what do you recommend for home care for wrinkles, uh, Valerie? Well, in skin perfusion, we can start with a time booster, which is enriched, you know, in retinol with high concentrations. And there's one of the key points of formulation of skin function products that they do integrate, you know, this active and reference ingredients to fight against wrinkles that is retinol, but combined with also an antioxidant, which is very well known, tocopherol and beta carotene to preserve the retinol. And there is also for hydration and smoothness, aloe vera and yarmic acid. What we can say with uh, clinical studies, some amazing results, you know, of minus 37.8 persons average wrinkle depth. Now, just precautions very important due to the retinal concentration is to use, you know, this booster for one month just by the evening, start the first week once or twice a week and after increase gradually. So next after we do have can you go next? The retinol, you do know it. It's a, you know, vitamin E, which is very renowned in FDA because you can find it in Roaccutane. But we do know that really the vitamin E, which is also present in uh, NCTF, it's one of the reference for antioxidant skin renewal and also to stimulate the production of collagen, yanric acid, and elastin. Then after wrinkles, we're going to go so another skin concern, which is very frequent, which is the slackening of the firmness. So Claudia, can you tell us more about it? Of course. So we know that skin sagging and wrinkles, they come together and they, were, they are one of the most important and frequent skin concerns of our patients. And we know that skin sagging is a complex of different events that happen together and that, that they give this clinical picture. We know there is a skeleton, um, resorption, we know that this happens from our bone and also we know there is a fat redistribution and there is a descent of the soft 
tissue fillers of the soft tissues when we don't have the support. But there is an important structure that I wanted to bring today to you because it's something that maybe we don't think about often. And it's a structure that is called the retinacula cutis uh, that Ricky explained to us. She was treating while she, while she was doing the bionutri lift treatment. So this is a subcutaneous network of collagenous fibers that connect the skin with the muscle and they are lying all in the subcutaneous tissue. And their main role is to maintain the support and counteract the gravitational and tensile forces and maintaining this three-dimensional and fibrous structure of the skin. So in this particular study, it's been shown that when the density of the retinacula cutis decreases, it correlates with an increase in sagging and decreases in elasticity of the subcutaneous tissue. So now, Ricky, I, I want you to tell us how do you treat this main skin concern of skin sagging with your patients? Okay, so before we start with the video, you can just wait for the video. I think with sagging, we know that there's quite a few things that we can do for sagging. And uh, I've already spoken about the bionutritive protocol. And then obviously we need to address the skin. And for sagging also, there's a really wonderful studies of skin revitalization with NCTF and even the microneedling roller, if you're not familiar with the mesotherapy techniques, can be really wonderful for the superficial skin sagging. But at the end, most of the patients with sagging want instant results and they want to walk out and see there's a lift. And the best way to do that is to use your hyaluronic acid cross-linked fillers to create the illusion of lifting. And we know it's not anymore just about filling up wrinkles, but almost like repositioning soft tissue and working on the retaining ligaments. There's a lot of wonderful articles talking about what we can do to the retaining ligaments to lift. And we can start the video. So this is just showing specific places where we can strategically place our fillers to actually give this lifting type of an effect. And I think the very first thing that there's been a lot of focus on lately is that when we do temple filling and especially the temporomandibular type of filling area, it's not only about filling the hollowness of the temples, but because we are filling here, we are actually giving a whole lifting effect uh, on this area. So what I'm using here is I'm using art filler volume because volume is indicated for the temples and it's a very volumizing product that's going to give with a very high G prime a nice lifting effect and placing it in the interfacial plane. And the interfacial plane is quite easy to reach from the top if you basically take the lateral border of the frontalis muscle or the temporal crest and you enter with a cannula right onto bone and slide it down, you reach the interfacial plane. And that gives already a nice lifting effect. Then on top of that also, if we then reposition the soft tissue in the mid phase and specifically the cheeks, because what do women do when they want lift uh, in the mirrors, they do this. So we place also the art filler volume specifically in that places to highlight the, the light and to give this kind of like a, a virtual lifting effect. So the lines that I've drawn on the patient's face is the hinder analysis. So from the nasal ala to the trachus and from the lateral canthus to the mouth corner. And this lateral triangle of the hinder analysis gives us a very good indication of where we can place our filler. It's in a deep plane, it's on the bone, but I never really want to touch the bone too much. And then lastly, the marionette folds also gives us this effect of sagging. And here I always prefer to work with the cannula. It's a very highly vascular area that bruises a lot. And we can really um, see the, the lift that we got immediately from the patient. So this is going to, to lift the subcutaneous tissue, work on the retaining ligaments, work on where the light falls on the face to give this lift effect. And then obviously we have to finish it by then ensuring that we treat the skin sagging also, because uh, this works on the deeper layers and the skin sagging we can treat with the bionutrilif protocol, NCTF, 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 but also with peelings, as we also know that peelings are familiar also to stimulate collagen. On the next slide, you will see I've got a patient 
with this typical sagging profile, uh, the marionette folds and the mouth corners. So, uh, yeah, sorry, the next one. And this is just to show, I, I just cut off the eyes of the patient, but just to show what type of result we can get. This was the protocol of by NutriShape. Now, a lot of doctors say, yes, I don't follow specific protocols. I individualize it and I totally agree with it. I just find the protocols is a good way to market to a patient something new in your practice. It gives us good guidance, the bi lift for the wrinkles, the bi shape to kind of give this lifting and structure to the face to give this lift up of an effect. Uh, and I think that's really the beauty of the protocols. So to finish off the sagging protocols, then I, I recommend then for my patients to use skincare products that also helps to treat the, the superficial layers because now with the fillers, I've worked on the deeper layers and now I want them to also treat the skin on top of it because often they say, yes, but there's still a little bit of a fold here or there. Then I said, yes, but I've lifted up the deeper layers. Now we need to lift up also the skin. And besides NCTF, they also have to then use the right product that will stimulate a lifting effect. And Valerie will explain to us which are the perfect ingredients that will actually give the skin a lifting effect. So beside what you presented, thank you, Ricky, thank you, Claudia. It sounds, uh, how would I say, making sense to have some, uh, on a daily routine, some lift boosters that are very enriched in collagen peptides and elastin peptides that we do know are the key ingredients, you know, for collagen fibers, elastin fibers. Here again, you can find in the formulations of skin perfusions that besides elastin and collagen peptides, we do have some resveratrol, which is one of the more potent antioxidants. And that makes sense also to find against the skin aging process, which is at the basic of the semiology of sagging. Here again, it is better to use it at night before a cream, which it can be 5 HP or 6 HP. If it's dehydrated 5 HP, if it's oily 6 HP enriched in zinc. So next. Yes, just some keywords on the peptides, but I think that everything has been uh, presented before, just we know that peptides uh, impact, you know, the firmness for replicant uh, skin surfaces, and they do have also a very strong anti-wrinkle properties. So now I think we will go to uh, resveratrol I've been talking about, which is one of the most famous antioxidants present in the red wine, you know, dans le raisin, and it's very good, you know, options every uh, you will see that with vitamin A in lift, you do have some tocopherol. If you have peptides plus resveratrol, so it makes sense to find first versus the symptoms and then versus the skin aging process. So uh, after we'll go back to something very important that is really international. It is the glow. And for this, I will uh, call Claudia for more uh, understanding of how Thank you, Valerie, for all these wonderful explanations of all the portfolio of filmed. And when we think about glow, we have to think about pigmentations, of course. So there are some pigmentations that are related to skin aging. We can classify them as hyper or hypopigmentation. And the good thing and the important thing about all of them is that they have very negative emotional impacts on our patients. And some of them to not say most of them are very challenging to treat because the etiology can be multifactorial. So melanin pigmentation plays a critical role in protecting the skin from the UV radiation. But when this becomes excessive or deficient, it can give rise to abnormal skin pigmentations. There are different genetic and environmental factors that contribute the regulation of pigmentation also, and there are different molecular mechanisms like DNA damage, tel telomerase, shortening, oxidative stress, hormonal changes, and autophagy impairment. So when we have pigmentary concerns related to oxidative stress, specifically aging, we classify them as hypermelanosis or hypomelanosis, depending 
on the amount of melanin present. So if we don't have melanin, one of the most representative diseases we know is vitiligo as the representative of hypomelanosis. And for hypermelanosis, the most common disease is of course melasma, but we have another different pictures like seborrheic keratosis that are benign skin tumors that happen in photoaging skin, particularly in elderly individuals. We also have solar lentigos and post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. And regarding melasma, I wanted to bring to you just something very particular about the pathophysiology. It's not only about melanocytes, as we traditionally have been thought about melasma, where there is an activation of the melanogenesis pathways that give the picture of melasma. But it's interestingly that in recent advances, we've seen that different cells are coming to being important players in, in the pathophysiology, like keratinocytes. There's also dermal inflammation, mast cells, angiogenesis, and also very important, the damage of the basement membranes that actually what this damage of basement membranes allow is that the pigment can go and the melanocytes can migrate to deeper layers. That means that they go to the dermis. So this is very important because with this, we know that there are different therapeutic targets that we can treat melasma with. For instance, um, tranexamic acid has become very popular in the treatment of melasma, particularly in Latin America. We use it a lot in our patients with very good results. And recently I'm adding to my protocols, the use of anti-allergics based on that I want to control the mast cell activation. So now I want to give the word to Ricky to tell us more about how she treats pigmentation in her clinic. Okay, so thank you, Claudia. And I think we can talk the whole evening or maybe more than the evening about pigmentation. It's so interesting. Uh, we can play the video in the meantime. The Binutri Glow protocol is a very simple protocol where we combine uh, the gluconolactone peeling uh, together with NCTF and then finishing it off with a B3 recovery or the mask that you apply. It's a protocol that is very easy for any doctor to incorporate in their clinic, not just for pigmentation, but even for acne that we will also discuss the blemishes and, and even just for prevention and for early signs of pigmentation. The nice thing about the Bionutri Glow protocol is it can also be dedicated to your assistant or nurse in your clinic, especially if you prefer that they then do the NCTF with the, the roller or maybe a pen device or some kind of electronic device. Uh, when it's done with a needle, it's done by the doctor. Uh, but when it's done with the roller or the pen, you can really dedicate the whole protocol. So it saves a lot of time. And I think especially in very busy practices, I've seen that this is often then dedicated. It's a protocol that I love in our country because it's suitable for all skin types and any type of pigmentation. The biggest fear I think with pigmentation always for me is to cause more inflammation. So that is why I really love the gluconolactone peels in all my melasma patients, because melasma and post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, uh, I think the biggest mistake that doctors make is they want to do too aggressive treatments, and then they end up by just causing more inflammation and then a relapse of the pigmentation, because that is how pigmentation is formed. Now, gluconolactone, the first time when you do gluc gluconolactone peels for patients that are used to maybe glycolic acid peels or TCA peels, they complain and they say it's not painful, but that's the whole idea. It's a more tolerable acid to use in appealing, but it's got the same efficacy as all of your other alpha hydroxy acids, but it's got very potent antioxidant activity. So for pigmentation, I really love it. And the next uh, slide, we can see it's a patient with quite a dark skin, severe post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation 
pigmentation that I managed to correct this patient's skin with this BioNutriGlow protocol, as well as the bright serum that uh, Valerie will explain. And it, it really, it takes a little bit of more patience, but as soon as you just want to go too deep and too harsh, that is when you just worsen the pigmentation, especially in darker skin type patients. So the right combination, and then I do the BioNutriGlow uh, protocol with the bright peel and not with the light peel. The light peel I prefer for my patients with blemishes because it contains also mandelic acid, which is very antibacterial. Whereas the bright peel is a perfect peeling for pigmentation because of the wonderful combination of phytic acid that we will discuss now, citric acid, which you know is also depigmenting, and then gluconolactin and also some glycolic acid. Uh, and then NCTF is so important in pigmentation. If you don't get results on melasma patients, it's because you're not adding NCTF to your protocol. And believe me, I've got more than 18 years of experience and to the point where sometimes you just think that nothing works for melasma, as soon as you add NCTF to the protocols, whether you're doing lasers, Q-switch, picoseconds, whatever, if the results stop uh, improving on melasma, add NCTF because it reduces the inflammation, it provides antioxidants, it corrects that whole skin barrier mechanism, the whole microbiome of the skin improves because we are looking after the skin, and for the first time you will start getting results for melasma by adding NCTF to the protocol. And remember, it also has got the wonderful depigmenting ingredients inside NCTF. And it's meant for injection, so it's totally suitable for the dermis. So I think uh, now the very important thing with pigmentation is they need to be on the perfect, perfect skincare. They need to be on something that, that I always say, it puts the melanosomes to sleep. So it needs to be products that reduces the, the melanogenesis process and then obviously sunscreen. So Valerie, can you explain to us why is Bright Booster such a success? Because I really have wonderful results in my practice on all skin types with Bright Boosters. Can you explain to me uh, why is it such a wonderful product for pigmentation? Well, thank you, Ricky. I think that uh, why is it a wonderful product? Because the formulation is wonderful. Formulation is made of you know, two very active gradients, as you explained, to fight against melanogenes, which is phytic acid, and also exists exil resorcinol, you will find it again in Ashisha ice cream, plus, you know, uh, some glycolic acid inside that will make a keratolytic actions, so of, uh, make a kind of um, synergy for all the ingredients to penetrate the skin. Something I want to say. It is very important to use it evening on a very prepared skin, cleansing with skin perfusion, uh, perfect lotion after put the skin boosters of bright booster for four weeks and after you can keep on going with the serum. But using exclusively by night and in the morning, as Ricky said, applied the sun protection. And as you can see, when we are talking about uh, <clears throat> So and we're about, uh, about spot, we are also talking about skin homogeneity, which is even more important. And then the clinical results just shows plus 40% of skin homogeneity after four weeks of skin boosters, of uh, bright boosters, sorry. Then after, uh, can we go, Claudia, the phytic acid is, uh, belongs to the big family of AHA, but is very, uh, would I say, dedicated in the tyrosinase to inhibit uh, uh, the melanin synthesis. Okay, then after, after, okay. So uh, not latest, but very important and current concern is hydration. And so uh, I will call Claudia to start with the mechanism, you know, of skin barrier when we talk about hydration concern. Perfect. Thank you, Valerie, for this wonderful explanation. So the skin barrier is a complex barrier system that is ex executed by several components that I will explain to you, the mechanical barrier, the chemical barrier, and the immunological barrier. And its main role is to maintain homeostasis of the skin by avoiding water and nutrient loss. It gives protection against environmental aggressors 
and it participates in skin absorption and drug, and drug delivery systems also. It participates in thermal regulation, sensation, and many metabolic processes. So this is a graphic of the skin barrier that we can find the first one that is the mechanical barrier that is composed of the stratum corneum and the tight junctions. There we can see that that microbiome is always present and is always interacting with all the stratum corneums. And in the stratum corneum, we find a structural protein and lipid matrix that is formed by cholesterol, ceramides, and triglycerides. And this is very important to maintain the water content in the skin and to prevent the transepidermal water loss. Then we have a chemical barrier, which is primarily formed by antimicrobial peptides, and they have important functions in inflammation and in healing processes. And, as, and then going deeper in the layers of the epidermis, we can find the immunological barrier, which is basically the innate and adaptive immune system that is responsible for cellular and humoral uh, reactions and recognition of pathogens. Also very important, as I was mentioning to you, the water content, when we have damaged skin, for example, uh, secondary to exposure to climate changes, low humidity, we have loss of this um, structured uh, uh, stratum corneum that I was telling you that is very important for the water content. And also when we have low states of critical states of water content, this relation um, can also be harmed and we can have an increased transepidermal water loss. So in the stratum corneum is very important the participation of other components like the natural moisturizing factor, which is secreted by the corneocytes in the stratum corneum and that will also prevent this water loss. And here we also have uh, an hydrolytic system that is very important for discamation. When discamation is impaired, we have the states of dryness in the skin, the appearance of flakes and dry skin also. And we also have some endogenous humectants like urea and glycerol, which are very important. Urea, for example, is decreased in patients with atopic dermatitis. And there's also water protein called aquaporin that it's very important for the transport of water and solutes in the epidermis. And of course, also the participation of electrolytes like potassium are very important for this equilibrium. And in the dermis, we find the hyaluronic acid that is well known by all of you, that it contributes for hydration and the plastic properties of the skin. We also have the participation of the sebaceous gland. When we talk about hydration, uh, its main role is to lubricate the skin and the hair and to prevent mechanical friction. What is very important about the sebaceous gland is that all these lipids, they need to be in a balance to work appropriately. So here we find that we have wax esters, esqualene, cholesterol, fatty acids, and here important, again, my, our microbiome plays an important role because it facilitates uh, the enzymatic processes where these lipids convert into antioxidants and antimicrobials that go to the out layer of the, our epidermis. So this is very important for our healthy skin to have a balance of, on this lipid composition. And we find that patients that have rosacea or sensitive skin, they have an altered lipid composition. So now I go to Ricky to tell us more about hydration protocols that she does for her patients. Yes, so I think the, the important message with hydration is to realize that most patients with dehydration has got an impaired skin barrier, but also those sensitive skin patients with a red skin and irritation that are sensitive to peelings. And, and a way that I explain it to my patient is that sometimes if your skin is really not having a good barrier, uh, it's better to put something in the skin than to remove the skin. So in those type of patients, I would stop the peelings if their skin is too sensitive and too dehydrated and first replenish with NCTF. So the video shows how I'm using NCTF 135HA with a nanosoft needle, uh, especially targeted around the eye 
eye areas. We get a lot of patients with dehydration wrinkles underneath the eyes, and it looks like many fine little wrinkles or even redness uh, that we can, oh, sorry, this video is the traditional mesotherapy technique. The next one is with the Nanosoft, uh, but just showing with the traditional mesotherapy technique, we can target the barrier, which is the epidermal layer uh, with the epidermal technique, which is 30 gauge needle. And then we can actually do the derma epidermal junction with the papules, which can either be done with uh, the traditional mesotherapy needles or then with the Nanosoft that I'll show on the next slide. I choose NCTF 135HA, especially if the patient has got a dull looking skin, the barrier is very much impaired, and you want to actually also give all of those vitamins, minerals, antioxidants. Uh, and this really, we know from all the studies, works on many aspects, and, and it really makes sense if we look at how the barrier is, how it will improve all of these aspects, and why we see the results. What we can realize also with this is because in the vial of NCTF, we've got 15 milligrams of free hyaluronic acid. It's five milligrams per milliliters. So it's a substantial amount of hyaluronic acid that we're delivering. But sometimes I go to MHA 10, which is 10 milligrams per milliliters, which gives us in the vial, 30 milligrams of hyaluronic acid. So this works really well for patients that you just want to do an extra boost of hyaluronic acid. You know their skin is very dehydrated or they really want to look fabulous very quickly because what does hyaluronic acid do? It pulls all the water because it's not cross-linked and they get this sudden glow and like plumping effect. And we can see the picture at the bottom is amazing. It's one session of the patient. Uh, I treated her on the Friday because she had a function on the Saturday. The Monday morning she came to me, she says, you have to take a photo because I've used her many times in presentations. She said, this time you have to take a photo because my skin looks wow. She said, it's just fabulous by doing the MHA 10 with a Nanosoft. Um, so as I said, Nanosoft is very perfect for around the eyes and the neck. But as you get to these very dehydrated skins, you can even treat uh, the large area of the face because the Nanosoft works well on a very dehydrated skin. But a thick, oily skin, you're going to struggle on the cheek area but you can see in this patient it really worked well also for for that area so the mha 10 would be your ultra hydrating very high concentration of hyaluronic acid to repair the skin barrier and to to really rehydrate the skin and replace the extra cellar matrix with the hyaluronic acid that it's lost and then obviously at home to then continue with using very good hyaluronic acid products, but also the correct creams for the skin uh, to, to, to choose the correct between 5 HP and 6 HP. Valerie, can you share experience of dry skins and which are the products that you recommend for, for dryness of the skin? So as intensive treatment as we've been presented, it will be the eye dry booster, as you can imagine, is rich in a uric acid of high molecular weight and very low molecular weight, plus ceramide as we've seen to protect the skin in the rears. And this one, of course, you can use it morning or evening. And you see that we can uh, reach plus 15% of uh, hydration. Then after, we do know that uric acid as presented by Claudia is really key for the architecture and the hydration of the dermis and also an excellent anti-aging action. So now, Claudia, uh, we will go to the latest, but not the least uh, concern, which will be blemishes. And for this, uh, we will have five minutes uh, left to conclude on the blemishes. Okay, so we know like blemishes are like a general term to name all these small circumscribed alterations that we can find in the skin that are considered anesthetic, but that they don't have like uh, life threatening important. And uh, most of them are benign and are any type of mark spot discoloration or flaw that we can see in the skin. And of course the causes can be multiple aging, sun exposure, acne lesions, rosacea, eczema, dermatitis, ingrown tear, and even birth marks can give this type of marks. And talking about this, I want to talk about a very problematic type of skin that we can find that is the oily sensitive type of skin that I'm sure a lot of you have seen in your practice. These are the typical patients that have things 
uh, related to blemishes, but they are very difficult to treat because they react to all treatments. So based on the Bauman skin type indicator, we have this type of skin that is the oily sensitive type skin subtype. And from this one, we have like four different subtypes, which are acne, rosacea, stinging, and allergic, depending more on the symptom that our patient relates. And in this type of patients, it's very important that in our treatments, we need to target the seborrhea and the hypersensitivity. And for this, we have the chemical pills based on alpha hydroxy acids that you perfectly, both of you mentioned, that are very important uh, to, set, to make a sebum regulation of the sebaceous gland. Of course, here comes oral isotretinoin, and in women, we can use spironolactone and oral contraceptives also. And we can also use antibiotics, peroxide, benzoyl, uh, probiotics that we've seen in, during all these lectures that, that they are very important. And in my practice, I use probiotics for all my patients. I use them systemically and I also use them applied. And of course, botulinum toxin has here a very important role because it can regulate the pore size and the sebum secretion. Of course, there are other environmental factors that we need to take into account when we talk about blemishes. And we know that mood changes like anxiety uh, can alter the skin, dysbiosis, all the exposome factors, the gut health, the genome, extensive uh, skin cares that can be aggressive to our skin are not very good and hormonal changes. And we need to consider also in the treatments, the use of blue light, probiotics, neuromodulators, and proper skincare. And this is a very interesting study that I found about how we perceive people that have blemishes versus the people that they have smoothed skin. And it's been shown that psychologically smoothed skin is linked to trustworthiness, competence, maturity, attractiveness, and health, whereas blemishes is linked to poor health and presence of infection. And there is a very negative influence of these skin blemishes that it actually can be stronger and more consistent than the positive influence of skin smoothness. And this is very important because skin blemishes can diminish any positive effect of smoothness on the skin. So the negative effect of blemishes in skin is larger and more salient than the positive effect even of having smooth skin. And with this, I want to give the word again to our dear Ricky to tell us how she treats the blemishes in her office. Okay, so uh, when we talk about blemishes and especially the oily sensitive skin, I have to say that I really love to use LED treatment. I really believe that LED treatment uh, plays a, a really major role in the skin type and reducing the bacterial count and the inflammatory reaction. But I like to prepare the skin to really absorb the LED light as much as possible. And to prepare the skin, I, I prefer in these type of oily sensitive skin, the light peel. Uh, the light peel is the, the softest of the range of the gluconolactone acid, and it contains mandelic acid, which is antibacterial. So very good results as a preparation. I saw there was a question also from one of the doctors, can we do LED peel, LED before peels? And I actually pre prepare with the gluconolactone with a light peel and then do the LED and really wonderful for these type of skins. Also, we know that microneedling is also very good for this type of skin. So NCTF microneedling, I also have really good results on acne sufferers specifically. And then the home care is really important to use the right home care because this is patients that need uh, that that often they have problem skin because of wrong skin care. And especially if we look at adult skin acne or adult skin blemishes, I uh, often see it because of incorrect skin care. So Valerie, can you uh, tell us about the ingredients that are really useful in the skin type? So many ingredients that uh, we do know have uh, some uh, successful efficiency is acid salicylic, acid lactic, and zinc. And uh, in this uh, balance booster, you will find these uh, three ingredients, 
which have both either mattifying effect, either increased cells elimination, either gentle exfoliant, also bacteriostatic, with reduction in terms of benefits on the skin of the pore size of minus 37% and the reduction of minus 42% of serum quantity. Well, what is important here is to use the 6HP uh, uh, cream, which is enriched uh, in zinc also. And we do know next, uh, Claudia, that zinc is such an important mineral uh, like salicylic we've seen, anti-inflammatory, keratolytic, comedolytic, but combined with zinc, very interesting due also to see properties of both immunogenicity on the skin, on the body, and um, very well combined with acid salicylic. Now, to conclude, uh, I want to thank you, Ricky. I want to thank you, Claudia. And uh, I will let uh, something very important. Why film it? Why are we so, I would say, uh, very conscious of, and rigorous about the skin concerns? Because we are all totally convinced there's there is a link between skin and quality of life. And that's why I will let uh, the end, that's the post-treatment we've been talking about and which with vitamin D3. But skincare and quality of life, I think, is something very important. And we should always have it in mind for whatever kind of aesthetic procedure we can apply, laser, injection, toxin, HA, to have a concern on a daily basis because please, Claudia, tell us more about it. Yes, of course. Skincare is very important because it has a very important impact on quality of life of our patients. This is at the end what we want. We want good outcomes in our patients. We want happy patients. And in this particular study that I want to bring as the last slide of our great presentation that is about quality of life, this is the Cosmeceutic Well. This is an, a tool for assessing dermal cosmetic products and how they impact the quality of life. And it's been shown that the quality of life was significantly reduced in patients who declared skin sagging, age spots, dehydration, wrinkles, and sensitive skin, which are the five main skin concerns of Filmit. So I found that, that very interesting to share with you and to see that we always have an opportunity every day to make a difference in our patient's life. Thank you very much, all of you. Great. So now we do have a question concerning uh, the use of peeling uh, before and after, uh, the use of lead before or after peeling. What can you answer, so, uh, Ricky? Yes, so, so LED, uh, it's always better to use at the end. I think it gives like a soothing effect and it's, it's really good to prepare the skin first with the peeling because then your LED will absorb better and you will have more of an antibacterial effect also by first removing the dead skin cells. So the, the superficial peeling and the gluconolactone peels is a really good preparation for LED and for your patients that have home LED devices because that's also very trendy, then I recommend uh, a pre-peel solution or the glycopeel mask is really good to prepare the skin for their home devices. So really something uh, that is, is very good in combination uh, for preparing for the LED. Great. So is there any other questions? I think I can maybe just add that we've seen so many times uh, really the quality of life improving when we focus on the skin and not just on wrinkles or lips. Uh, and I, I really think that especially women, they always talk about when they don't have a good day, they've got a bad hair day. But I really think it's a lot more a bad skin day. So skin is so important for what people oh, feel yeah. like. I'm Yes, I'm convinced. And it's the first thing on the beauty apps that, that the young people correct is they correct their skin. So they first choose the, the filter to have a better skin. So it just shows how important skin is for people and what they think of skin. Of Ricky, course. I have yeah. another question for you. Ricky, can you use NCTF with botulinum toxin? Does it uh, reduce skin size, pore size? 
So, yes. So, first of all, NCTF has got studies to show that it reduces spore size. So, um, uh, if I remember correctly, the study, uh, Valerie, maybe you can help me, was a 40% reduction in pore size in yes. the three sessions of NCTF. But then you have to really make sure that you target it intradermal. So, you need to do papules over the pore size. Also, we know even if you use it with a roller, because that also has got studies on pore size reduction, but I still prefer to do the intradermal injections or the nanosoft if it's possible in the area to reduce the pore size. So NCTF works. Then we know also botulinum toxin has got studies. It's off-label use, but there is independent studies to show that the intradermal injection with botulinum toxin can also reduce pore size. But you have to use the product separately because neither of the companies will support the mixing of the product. So you will first do your NCTF and then you finish with your botulinum toxin in a separate syringe, also in an intradermal injection. Exactly. Well, my dear colleague, my dear friends, all the film team, thank you very much for the organization, the preparation for all the attendees. I want to tell you that you can find this full webinar on YouTube or on filmed.com. And uh, see you soon on the wine. Have a nice evening or a nice afternoon or a nice morning or a nice journey and take care and see you soon. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Ricky and Valerie. Thank you, audience. Bye-bye. Everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Carlotta. Thank you. Ciao. To the whole team. Thank you. Ciao. See you soon.